Thank you, Rick, for that blessing. Good morning again. Thank you all uh, who are here in attendance, uh, both in person and for those joining us via live stream. Uh, we welcome you to what is our first prevention event for our diabetes uh, program here at IHC for the year of 2023. So thank you for uh, being here with us and helping us celebrate. Um, we'll talk more about our team later, but we wanna get right to our guest speaker who has uh, graced us by joining us uh, this morning. Um, we had originally thought Dr. Uh, Kawar was gonna join us, but some circumstances occurred and we actually have been told he's brought, has had a, a much smarter colleague has come to join us today. So no pressure, but we're expecting great things. So with us today, we have Dr. Zaid Al-Dahan, uh, who was born and raised in Lancaster, California, uh, did his undergraduate at UC San Diego in human biology, went to med school at Ross University School of Medicine, did his residency at the University of Las Vegas, Nevada, and fellowship at UCSD in nephrology. He is board certified, and he joined Balboa Nephrology Medical Group in Escondido in October. Um, so he says in his free time, he enjoys taking his dog to the beach, playing tennis and beach volleyball, and spending time with the family. So uh, join me in welcoming our speaker today. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Zaid, for that introduction and to the Indian Health Council for having me. Um, I'm a nephrologist by training. And so I, I thought this was uh, an important opportunity for me to engage with the community, to meet all of you, um, to provide some information and introduction to what we do as nephrologists and you know what we are focused on as far as chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and changing outcomes. And so um, it's always nice to be out here in the community, see all of you outside of the clinic. Um, I did uh, make this talk more so for patients, um, non-providers, but also to help you know, uh, providers get some insight into chronic kidney disease. Um, so you'll, you'll see some of the language is kind of technical. I will kind of walk you through it. Um, a lot of abbreviations like CKD for chronic kidney disease. Um, I am new with Balboa Nephrology, and so I've uh, already seen a lot of uh, patients from the Indian Health Council as referrals, and I, I'm sure I'll be seeing more. So I, I welcome all the referrals, and uh, you know I welcome uh, interacting with all of you. Okay, so feel free to stop me at any time. You know, as I'm going through, you could just raise your hand or, or uh, go ahead and start speaking. Okay, if anything is unclear, or if you want any uh, further information. So I think you will, we'll start out the talk by kind of defining chronic kidney disease, um, giving some general background, uh, and then kind of what our screening efforts are like, which really starts here at the local clinics, uh, and then kind of what are reasons to refer to actually see a kidney doctor regarding kidney dysfunction, um, some of the management guidelines and then I, I did carve out some time for this new class of medications called SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, you've probably seen them advertised on TV. And then lastly, we'll finish off with kind of what happens when kidney function declines to the point that, you know, it's not enough to support uh, normal physiology, normal body uh, processes. So chronic kidney disease, uh, it's defined as abnormalities of kidney structure or function for at least three months, okay? Um, to see that there's abnormal kidney function and for it to persist for three months tells you the kidney is diseased and it's chronic, meaning it's likely irreversible. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes blood tests are checked and we look at... Uh, a certain value in the blood test called the creatinine. From that, we calculate uh, a glomerular filtration rate. That really means your percentage of kidney function. And that's how we stage chronic kidney disease. Um, it's not only the, the GFR, the percentage of kidney function, but also the amount of protein. Both are very important in understanding and, and defining chronic kidney disease. 
So you'll see, you know, normal kidney function is really 90% or more. Um, we start to define chronic kidney disease at really 60% and below. Um, if there are abnormalities like protein in the urine, which normally should not be leaking out into the urine, um, and you're below 90, then you are at the earlier stages. But really, we start defining chronic kidney disease at a, a percent of kidney function at 60% below. Okay. Um, when you drop below 60%, you fall into the uh, mild to moderate category. That is stage 3 kidney disease. Below from 60 to 30 is, is kind of the stage 3 range. Below 30% is stage 4 range. And below 15% is stage 5 range. Um, you know, we like to catch patients early on, as early as possible, to, to prevent progression. Um, when you reach something like, you know, a level of stage five and you are at 15 percent or below, that's when we start talking about dialysis. And so our, our goal is always to identify these patients early on and start putting on, you know, strategies and medications um, to help delay the progression and decline of kidney function. So some general information, type 2 diabetes overwhelmingly is um, the, the world leading cause of chronic kidney disease. Um, the presence of albuminuria, which is really protein leakage into the urine, is the single most important risk factor for um, the progression of chronic kidney disease. So anytime we identify a high creatinine, the next step really is to identify, is this person leaking protein into the urine, because that really tells us there's some structural uh, damage to the kidney. Um, chronic kidney disease is oftentimes not causing symptoms until it's too late. And so that's why screening is really important. Um, once you do get to a very advanced kidney function, which is really you know, below 25 to 30 percent, then you start seeing the complications of uh, poor kidney function, and that is swelling, volume overload, elevated potassium levels, um, elevated acid levels, worsening high blood pressure, uh, anemia, worsening uh, calcium levels, higher phosphorus levels. And, and then, you know, once you decline even further, you start to develop the uh, syndrome called uremia, which is really a buildup of toxins. And we'll kind of go over what that means and what those symptoms are. So, um, you know, when we identify patients with kidney disease, first we try and accurately diagnose them, see if there's anything reversible that we can treat. Um, beyond that, really, the strategy is preventing the decline of kidney function or trying to slow it down as much as possible. Um, once, you know, kidney function really declines to a point that you're starting to have complications, we have to start treating those. Um, as kidney function declines, a lot of medicines that we take are dependent on clearance by the kidney into the urine. And so you, you really do need to watch your medicines and see that they're being um, dosed appropriately for your level of kidney function. And then, you know, when it comes to declining kidney function, we always want to be ahead of the game, have patients being monitored frequently. And if dialysis is an issue or actually is a requirement, then, you know, having uh, uh, an informed decision between the doctor and the physician or between the doctor and the patient about what to do next. So screening for kidney disease, it allows us to accurately diagnose and, and start medications early on. It allows us to capture the highest risk patients, uh, the ones who will need closer follow-up. Um, it allows us to, you know, make sure this is not something to really worry about and reassure the lower risk patients. And then really, you know, because diabetes is so prevalent, it allows us to, to identify the patients who have chronic kidney disease from diabetes. So who should be screened? Really, all diabetic patients, even very mild diabetes, should be checked, you know, uh, not only kidney function from blood tests, but urine tests as well to look for protein leakage. Um, other kind of patients who should generally be, you know, screened for chronic kidney disease, those with edema, which is swelling, leg swelling, shortness of breath um, when walking around, and high blood pressure. 
Uh, high blood pressure is also damaging to the kidney, and really it makes things worse when it's um, present alongside diabetes. So those are patients who are appropriate to screen. How are they screened? Really, uh, urinalysis, simple urine sample, um, to look for the presence of protein, the presence of red blood cells, white blood cells. Um, and then uh, a, a further check on the, the, the amount of protein in the urine. This is usually done with the second void of the day, just like a urinalysis. So when you go and you're, you're going to give a urine sample, you really should urinate at home first and um, not give your, your first void of the day to the, to the lab um, because that can be falsely high in proteins. So low level protein uh, in the urine is about 30 to 300 milligrams. Higher level, more worrisome level of, of protein leakage is 300 milligrams or more. Creatinine and the associated calculated uh, estimated GFR, eGFR, um, is the other marker we use to screen. And, um, you know, as a side note, 35% of patients with diabetes who have CKD um, don't have proteinuria. Uh, we use a, a calculation called the CKD epi calculation to estimate uh, percent of kidney function. And a lot of times patients may be hyperfiltering. That is, their GFR, their percent of kidney function, may be supranormal because of the early effects of diabetic kidney disease. So that's why checking for protein is another important uh, step in identifying these patients. So CKD and protein leakage, albuminuria. Um, increased protein loss in the urine does predispose to some complications. So you will lose protein in the bloodstream, and that protein in the bloodstream is important for maintaining the normal amount of fluid in the blood. Once that diminishes, you start to get swelling in the legs. Um, you do get higher lipid levels. Uh, you are at higher risk for clots in the legs and in the deep veins of the legs, and then those clots, you know, um, as a complication, dislodging and going to the lungs causing a pulmonary embolism. Um, complications from worsening kidney function, you can have drug toxicity because the drugs are building up in toxic levels. The acid base and electrolyte complications like a higher potassium, higher acid level. Um, neuropathy, which we know is very common in diabetes. And then, you know, complications related to both having, you know, not only kidney function decline, but increased uh, protein in the urine predisposes to higher cardiovascular disease, um, higher incidence of heart attacks, fluid overload, anemia, malnutrition, uh, because you're losing so much protein, cognitive impairment, that is kind of d dementia, uh, frailty, and infections, okay? So losing a lot of protein also makes you immunosuppressed, immunocompromised. So why do we screen? Um, you know, it, it's fairly, fairly obvious, we, we need to screen because we need to identify uh, the patients who are diabetic and have chronic kidney disease. Uh, we need to identify those who have chronic kidney disease, not from diabetes. And then it allows us to identify these patients early and, and try and do something about it. So proteinuria, the leakage of protein in the urine is on its own a risk factor for um, not only worsening kidney function, but worsening cardiovascular disease. So we have noticed an association with or without declining kidney function that protein leakage in the urine and those who have it are at higher risk for heart attacks, are at higher risk for uh, heart failure. And so proteinuria is something we all have to pay very close attention to. Um, it's generally a bad sign. And so you know treatment is very important in those cases. Proteinuria, um, you know, for the providers, it, it's important to know you identify protein leakage in the urine. Is there an abnormal creatinine or not? If there is an abnormal creatinine, this is something that's more urgent. Um, you know, if, if you do have evidence of a higher creatinine, then there is definitely some disease happening in the kidney, and that requires uh, a more prompt investigation. 
So there is protein in the urine. Is this diabetic kidney disease? Well, um, it is if these, these factors are at play. If there's a long history of diabetes, and by long history, I usually mean seven to 10 years of diabetes, will then um, predispose to chronic kidney disease. If there's an elevated amount of protein, if there's a presence of retinopathy, so you know, if, when you notice or when you've been screened by your um, ophthalmologist for retinopathy, if that's present, there is likely kidney disease as well because the fine vessels of the retina are affected the same way as the fine vessels in the kidney from the diabetes. If you check for other causes and they're negative, so you screen for viral hepatitis, HIV, autoimmune diseases, um, that supports the diagnosis of diabetes causing uh, kidney disease. And the lack of blood in the urine. So diabetes typically doesn't cause any blood leakage. You won't really see red blood cells in the urine um, you can in the very late stages, but typically that's not a feature of diabetic kidney disease. Um, now, to, to fully know, to know with complete certainty what is damaging the kidney, you need a kidney biopsy. And for some patients, we, we do push for kidney biopsy. Uh, a lot of times you'll see that, you know, if there's all these factors, a long history of diabetes, retinopathy, neuropathy from the diabetes, then you're pretty certain that the, the, the kidney damage that's happening is diabetes and you really don't pursue a biopsy. Um, it's only when cases are borderline that you say, you know what, I want you know, an actual invasive test, the patient to get you know, a needle uh, biopsy done and that we can you know, look at it under the microscope and further diagnose this problem. The vast majority of, of diabetic patients with CKD don't require a biopsy. So this is kind of a, a differential list of, of uh, diagnoses that could be present in non-diabetics when you're dealing with proteinuria and, and kidney function decline. This is in no way the, the whole list. So this is kind of just an abbreviated list of things that could be uh, causing kidney function decline. So hypertension, as I, as I mentioned, is a, a well-known cause of kidney disease. Um, what you'll notice with hypertension is that there's very low level protein leakage, if, if any at all. Um, there's a caveat to that. If hypertension has caused damage to the kidney over a very long period of time, you can get secondary changes to the kidney and then quite a, quite a bit of protein leakage. So that's where it gets some, sometimes kind of tricky. But um, lots of protein leakage and a patient who is not diabetic, you start to think about autoimmune diseases like membranous nephropathy, um, a process called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, IgA nephropathy, which is really one of the most common, if not the most common, um, kidney disease uh, outside of diabetes that is autoimmune in nature. Uh, vasculitis diseases, inflammation of the blood vessels, lupus um, causing kidney disease, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, HIV can cause kidney disease, and then multiple myeloma, uh, a blood cancer, can cause kidney disease. So these are all things to consider um, and consider testing for when you have a patient who is not diabetic but does have chronic kidney disease and does have protein leakage. Okay, so the appropriate workup. Um, I included an ultrasound of the kidney. By the guidelines, this isn't necessarily an absolute. Um, I think it's always helpful to have a kidney ultrasound uh, with a post-void residual. That is, uh, by having the patient not only check the ultrasound, but urinate right after and then check the bladder to see, is there any retention of, of urine? Sometimes that alone causes some kidney damage. Uh, beyond that, a, a urinalysis with microscopic analysis, the more the merrier. I, 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 I like putting that there because as nephrologists, we love urinalyses. It's, it's, it's like the, you know, one of the most telling tests we have. And so if we get uh, a patient referred to us and we have all these urinalyses to uh, review, that's awesome. It's very helpful. Once you identify protein in the urine, it's very important to quantify how much. We should know really, you know, what, what degree of protein leakage is this? Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is, is it severe? And you can do that just by checking a spot, urine albumin to creatinine ratio, a total protein to creatinine ratio. If you really want to quantify protein and it's a lot, you can do a 24-hour collection. And so your, your doctor might ask you to take home a jug, pee in it for a whole day, take it back to the lab, and they would measure 
how much protein you excreted in a, in a 24 hour period. Some blood tests uh, that help identify the patients who are not diabetic but have chronic kidney disease. You check for hepatitis, um, HIV, hepatitis C antibodies, and ANA is a lupus test. Um, Consider checking for myeloma in patients over 50 who are uh, anemic, um, and that you can just check, you know, a, a protein electrophoresis. Um, you don't necessarily need to check a urine protein electrophoresis. Serum-free light chains are always helpful. Uh, we don't really um, recommend checking ONCA RPR and complements, uh, you know, for routine screening. I think sometimes it's hard to interpret. And so I think that's, uh, you know, better for the nephrologist to check if they're suspicious for any of those uh, diseases. So in summary, the workup really most appropriate things are a urinalysis. If there's proteinuria, please check how much uh, with a, uh, a urine albumin to creatinine ratio or urine protein to creatinine ratio. Um, get a limited serological workup if this is not diabetes and consider getting a kidney ultrasound before they're referred to see a kidney doctor. Okay, so um, some kind of management tips. What medications and what, what kind of lifestyle changes do we recommend when you have diabetes and chronic kidney disease? Um, you know, the, the lifestyle changes are fairly generic. You will be asked to do this by your doctor just from having diabetes. And that's, you know, weight loss efforts, so increased exercise, diet counseling, watching your carb intake. Um, if you're a smoker, quitting smoking. Um, those are really kind of the, 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 the general recommendations for anyone with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. The general treatment, as far as medications, is aimed at um, really controlling the diabetes. That's the underlying portion. That's what's damaging the kidney. Um, aiming for a goal hemoglobin A1C of less than seven. Um, in the elderly, you can make the exception of, of goaling the hemoglobin A1C of less than eight. Um, good blood pressure control and medications added on to help cut back the amount of protein leakage. Uh, for cardiovascular risk, you know, it's important to be on lipid lowering agents. These are the statins usually. Uh, a lot of patients with diabetes are very familiar with these medicines, atorvastatin, Lipitor, Crestor, those types of medications, um, antiplatelet medications to help with peripheral vascular disease. And then, you know, routine CKD care, which is uh, really all of those things, blood pressure, um, volume management, if you're having swelling, and then dealing with the complications of, of uh, advanced chronic kidney disease. So uh, blood pressure uh, medications in diabetics. Really, it's uh, the ACE inhibitors, it's ACE I or angiotensin receptor blockers uh, for both type one and type two diabetics. These medications are the medications like Losartan, Valsartan, uh, Lisinopril, Focinopril, any, any of the prills or the artins, um, those are really the first line medications for controlling blood pressure. Um, they're even more important to be applied when the, the patient has diabetes and proteinuria. Um, beyond that, the, the second line medications that you would add on when the blood pressure is not fully at goal are the long acting uh, thiazide diuretics like chlorthalidone, um, indapamide, calcium channel blockers, first line agents like amlodipine, nifedipine, and then um, more of a second line agent is, uh, you know, the, the beta blockers, metoprolol, carvedilol, those types of drugs. So the goal blood pressure um, in patients with high blood pressure, patients with high blood pressure and diabetes or just diabetes alone is to be below 130 over 80. This is a little controversial as of late. Uh, there are some new guidelines that say really Patients with chronic kidney disease should be aimed uh, to, to reach a blood pressure below 120 over 80. Um, for now, I'm just sticking with 130 over 80, the more liberal goal. Um, the, the key should really to be to maximize the ACE inhibitor or the angiotensin receptor blocker as much as possible. So get the patient up to the maximum dose. Um, this can be limited by low blood pressure, 
or uh, a higher potassium. Um, but, you know, try your best to get them up to the highest tolerated dose. Um, I put a note here about ARBs over ACE inhibitors, kind of for the providers to think about. I've started doing this in my own practice where I'll just, if I'm going to start um, either of these agents, I'll really just start Losartan. I'll go for an angiotensin receptor blocker because, um, you know, lisinopril and the ACE inhibitors are known to have cough as a side effect. You kind of skip that whole side effect um, issue if you go straight to an angiotensin receptor blocker. And they have some benefit in terms of uh, excreting uric acid. So they're very mild, you know, very modest uh, uricose uric agents. So in patients with gout, an ARB is, is preferred over, uh, over uh, uh, ACE inhibitor. Um, when you start these medications, give them at least two weeks to really work and, and uh, uh, work on reducing the amount of protein leakage. Um, add a thiazide diuretic or a calcium channel blocker next if the blood pressure is uncontrolled. Um, sick day precautions. This is very important for really everyone to know. When you're on these medications, um, like an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, if you are feeling sick for whatever reason, even just a, a sore throat, uh, especially if you're dehydrated, not eating and drinking normally, having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, don't take your Losartan or your lisinopril those days. It's better not to just because if you get dehydrated, it can injure the kidney. Normally, these are great medicines, and they're great at delaying the progression of kidney disease. But in these intervals where you're sick, don't take the medication. That applies to the SGLT2 inhibitors as well. So all the flozins, the empagliflozins, the Jardians, the uh, Farsiga. If you're feeling sick for whatever reason, it's okay to hold it. Once you're feeling better, you can restart the medicine. Okay, so the SGLT2 inhibitors, the, the so-called flozins, um, these are being marketed on TV like crazy right now. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen commercials about uh, Jardians, Farsiga, Invokana. Um, these medications are designed to inhibit sugar reuptake in the kidney. So whatever sugar gets spilt into the urine normally gets uh, uh, re, uh, reabsorbed. What this medication does is it makes you pee out that sugar. It stops that channel from reabsorbing the sugar. That's nice, and it was really uh, designed to be a diabetes medicine so that you can clear some sugar that way. What we found is that it's a mild to kind of modest diabetes medicine. It's actually much better for, for proteinuric kidney disease and kidney disease in general, really. Um, it has great effects in... Uh, really delaying the decline of kidney function. And so we really encourage all of our patients to be on these medicines. Um, and we're very excited about this, this class of, of drugs. So um, these can be added on when patients are already on a lisinopril or a losartan. Um, patients with chronic kidney disease, with or without diabetes, and have some level of proteinuria are good candidates for this medicine. Uh, really they're safe to start as low as uh, estimated kidney function of 20%. Uh, the way they were studied is really for people between 60 and 20%. So I think, you know, the starting point um, is really once they've hit CKD, the beginning part of CKD stage three. Um, in one of the biggest trials on these medications, they uh, demonstrated a 30% reduction in end stage kidney disease, uh, doubling of the serum creatinine or renal cause of death. So 30% is pretty significant. Um, this is something we're very excited about. That's, that's a big impact on people who have chronic kidney disease because as, as doctors, um, as nephrologists, we are so concerned about our, our patients declining all the way to the point that they need dialysis. And so if we can slow that down, that's tremendous. Um, these medicines are very good at cutting back on the protein leakage in the urine. And that has been shown to delay the progression of chronic kidney disease. So what we see is patients with very high levels of protein in the urine, they are the ones who progress much faster. If you can cut back on the amount of protein leakage, you can really affect uh, the, the rate at which they decline. Um, 
some secondary effects that they noticed with this drug uh, during the trial is that these patients who were on it had a decreased risk for heart failure hospitalizations, for cardiovascular related death, for heart attacks, strokes. They had better uh, uh, diabetes control, they had better blood pressure control, and they had uh, actually more weight loss. Uh, this is in large part due to the fact that these medicines act sort of like diuretics. They will make you pee a little bit more. Um, they do get rid of some sodium too. And so they're good for heart failure. Um, they're good for, you know, some mild to moderate swelling. Um, and they're really just generally good for the patient uh, overall. I, I put some, um, some graphs here from, uh, from the Credence trial um, to kind of illustrate the amount of proteinuria. If you look at the um, treatment line, this was the patients the, that received canagliflozin. And you'll notice uh, their amount of protein reduction came down and stayed at a, a very uh, stable level. Whereas those who weren't treated with the drug with just placebo alone maintained this high level of protein loss in their urine. Here, uh, you'll see the patients who um, were started on canagliflozin initially had a reduction in their GFR. And then their decline was blunted by the medicine, whereas you see those who didn't take it declined much faster. And at 42 months, you know, they had worse kidney function than those who had started the medicine and stayed on it. Um, this is really uh, a note to the providers who are starting this medication. Yes. Did you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah One, I think two. That's more for the audience online. But I'll, I'll go ahead and summarize the, the yeah. question. Um, that's a great question. Yes. So when taking uh, diuretics and these medicines that I'm mentioning, they are diuretics. They are going to make you lose fluid and electrolytes. And cramping is um, a complication of that. You can, you can uh, actually experience cramping from that. Um, that's something that you have to discuss with your doctor. I, a lot of times it's a, a matter of just reducing the dose. If you're on a medication like this, perhaps you don't need so much of something like a Lasix or one of, one of your other diuretics. You can count on this medication more and then you won't have the cramping. That's typically what we'll do. Um, well, drinking more. Well, drink. Is it, is it on? Anyway, will drinking more water help you not to have leg cramps? Technically, yes. But the whole point is to kind of, if you're developing leg swelling, to limit your water intake. Because that already means that you have too much fluid on your body. Okay, so really the goal is not to drink more water to offset the cramping, but to see if there's an electrolyte problem to fix and to cut back on the amount of diuretic. Okay. Great questions. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to point out this, whoops, this portion, um, especially for the providers, uh, so that, you know, they're, they're more comfortable with starting this medicine. Yes, go ahead. But, um, I, oh, I get a lot of leg cramps too, but what I use is that Calm magnesium powder. Yes. And that helps tremendously. I just add the powder to my water bottles when I get it, and it helps with my cramping right away. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's a great point. It, a lot of times cramping is either a low magnesium or a yeah. low potassium. So to give yourself a, a magnesium supplement can help, definitely. I don't know that, that formulation, but I imagine it has some vitamins and, and electrolytes like magnesium. Yeah, that's usually what they have. Um, so, you know, when the patients who were started in this study, um, and this is in general, started on this medication, you do see an early decline in kidney function. 
Now, this is not actually a kidney injury. And that's, that's really what I, I, is the take home here. Um, it doesn't reflect actual kidney injury from the medicine. It reflects a hemodynamic change um, from the amount of blood that's being filtered. So don't be alarmed if you see the creatinine rise after starting this medicine. A 20 to 30% rise, much like starting uh, an ACE or ARB, is appropriate, okay? And it's, it's, it does not mean that the kidney function is getting worse. Okay, so adverse effects, problems with these medicines. It's important to talk about um, because these medicines make you pee out sugar, you are at higher risk for urinary tract infections. Uh, in males, this is not as much of a problem, but in women, um, certainly women are higher risk for UTIs, and so peeing out sugar may, may put you at higher risk for a UTI. If it happens, the key really is stop the medicine, call your doctor, uh, get a urinalysis, make sure it's actually a, a UTI, and then you can get treatment for it, okay? Um, other complications, uh, alongside urinary tract infections, you can get a fungal rash in the growing area. Um, you know, the, the strategy is really the same. Stop the medicine, call your doctor, you know, get some kind of cream uh, or oral medication for the, the fungal infection, um, and then discuss restarting the medicine with your doctor. Um, you know, one, one other complication uh, to mention, or a few other complications to mention, DKA, very rare, but you can see euglycemic DKA uh, when using these medicines. Um, volume depletion and polyuria, like we were just talking about, these are diuretics. Uh, you will notice more urine output with them. Some patients, especially those with very uncontrolled diabetes, can get uh, a lot of urinary loss and get dehydrated. Um, and that's why I caution, you know, uh, patients not to use this medicine when they're uncontrolled and have an A1C of 10 or greater. Um, my, my general rule of thumb is when a UTI or a fungal rash develops, I stop the medicine, treat the UTI, and then I'll restart it once, once the, the infection's resolved. If it happens more than two times, that's when I kind of just stop the medicine. Um, and, and kind of reevaluate what's going on. Uh, I usually give patients, you know, two episodes until I decide, all right, this, this is causing too many problems in terms of UTIs, uh, because I really do think these are important medicines to be on. Um, certainly, if you get severely ill and you're admitted to the ICU from urinary sepsis, that's a good reason not to be on it anymore. Um, but a simple UTI, you know, I think it's fair to just get treatment for it, stop the medicine at that time, and then restart it once your, uh, your symptoms have gone and you've been treated. Okay, so when should you see a kidney doctor? Um, you know, the, the general guidelines as they stand right now is to be referred when your kidney function drops below 30%. I, you know, think otherwise. I think really we should start seeing these patients um, in the clinic when they're below 45%. Um, for patients who have persistent high levels of protein leakage, despite being on the angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors, despite being on SGLT2 inhibitors, um, those are good patients that we should, you know, be involved with. Um, whenever you see abnormal urine microscopy, you're seeing cellular casts, a lot of uh, blood leakage or any amount of blood leakage, um, any amount of white blood cells in the absence of a, a urinary tract infection, we should see those patients. Personal history of systemic autoimmune disease, like someone with lupus, usually should at least, you know, establish care with a nephrologist, um, even if there's no, no evidence of uh, kidney dysfunction. Patients who have uh, a lot of cysts or large uh, kidneys on uh, kidney ultrasound should be referred to see a kidney doctor. And the list goes on and on. So a history of multiple myeloma, um, evidence of rapid, rapid loss of kidney function, that is someone who's losing more than five milliliters per minute uh, or a 25% decline in a single year. Um, I made a note that creatinine Though, uh, you know, when it, when it rises, should always be rechecked promptly, ideally within a month. 
um, prior to referral so that you can confirm that there's actually a kidney injury or a sustained injury happening. Um, patients who are difficult to manage in terms of diuretics, people who just um, have a lot of swelling and are, are very hard to, you know, get the, or manage the swelling with just uh, the, you know, oral diuretics. Um, people who are starting to develop the severe complications of chronic kidney disease, like elevated potassium levels, elevated acid levels, anemia, um, high phosphate levels, low calcium levels, they should definitely be seen by a nephrologist. So patients with a single kidney, either born that way or um, because of, uh, you know, a, a acquired cause should be seen by a kidney doctor. Um, someone who has uh, chronic kidney disease of unknown cause, especially those uh, who are younger, uh, people with very difficult to control high blood pressure, people with um, recurrent uh, kidney stones, people who have, you know, a presumed or known history of hereditary kidney disease, um, and people who are on various medications, especially drugs that are toxic to the kidney, like chemotherapy agents, should be seen by a kidney doctor. Okay, so when it comes to referring, uh, it depends on really how sick the patient is. So, you know, I, I say there are two choices here. One is to uh, send the patient straight to a kidney smart class. This is your patient who is in advanced kidney failure, approaching, you know, stage five kidney disease. Um, it may be better to get them straight to a kidney smart class before uh, seeing the kidney doctor. Uh, kidney smart class is really a class meant to talk to patients about kidney replacement therapy. That is dialysis and transplant. Okay. Um, and that's appropriate for people who are really below stage, uh, you know, below a 30% a, a uh, function and, uh, you know, 25 to 30% of function. So um, outcomes from early referral. Patients who, you know, get to establish care with a kidney doctor are four times more likely to start on a whole modality of dialysis, uh, which is usually more preferred for for the general population, um, they're two times more likely to have their first treatment in center instead of uh, crash starting into a hospital. Um, they're more likely uh, to have an ideal access in place and already have that um, done and taken care of. They're more likely to stay active and working uh, and less likely to kind of feel like they're suffering from an ailing body and have depression from worsening kidney function. Patients who don't necessarily need to be referred, um, patients with simple cysts, these are common, they're age-related. Um, you know, a lot of patients, especially with increasing age, have a prevalence of just simple cysts in the kidney. Um, elderly patients who have just mild kidney dysfunction, that's pretty stable, don't necessarily, don't necessarily need to be referred to see a kidney specialist. Uh, renal replacement therapy. So this is a fancy word for dialysis and transplant. Um, when it comes to dialysis, there's a few different ways of doing it. The, the main designation is really hemodialysis, that's through the bloodstream, or peritoneal dialysis, that's through the abdomen. Um, hemodialysis involves taking blood from the body, running it through tubing, through a machine, to really do what the kidney should be doing, that is clean out toxins, remove fluid, remove potassium, remove acid, and then returning that blood to the body. This is typically done at a clinic three times a week uh, for three and a half to four hours uh, each time. So really, hemodialysis is like a part-time job. It's really a burden, um, but it's what patients need to stay alive when they have very advanced kidney disease and are end-stage end-stage uh, kidney disease. Um, there is nocturnal dialysis. That's reserved really for a subset of patients. Uh, the vast majority of patients, if they're going to do hemodialysis, do it in the center three times a week. Home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. This, these are the home modalities that Medicare is really pushing for and for good reason. Uh, because we've noticed patients do better on the home modalities. When they can dialyze themselves, 
It gives them better autonomy to run their own lives, not be burdened by going to a clinic three times a week. Um, they get better clearance because they're able to do dialysis on a daily basis. They feel better. Um, survival outcomes so far, early studies suggest it is better overall to be doing dialysis at home. Um, quality of life is better. Like I said, autonomy is better. So these are really the preferred strategies. It doesn't, it doesn't suit everyone. So not everyone is really a good candidate for this, but we definitely do um, try and have these discussions and, and start the patient on a home uh, modality if they're appropriate for it. Uh, kidney transplant. This is kidney replacement therapy because you're getting a, a kidney that essentially cures you of end-stage kidney disease. Uh, but with that comes, you know, a surgery to transplant the kidney, a lot of immunosuppression and really lifelong immunosuppression uh, for as long as that kidney is working um, and even beyond that stage uh, sometimes. So um, I, I didn't include a lot on kidney transplant because I think um, it's, it's a very large topic. And so I just kind of wanted to briefly touch on it um, the last point here is conservative kidney care. Now, patients who have declined to the point of end-stage kidney disease may or may not be good candidates for dialysis. Dialysis is really a way of prolonging life um, because the organ has failed, and so this is the only option for people to stay alive. But, you know, in a patient who is, let's say, very frail, very elderly, has poor social support, you know, doesn't um, have much family or friends around to help, um, has a lot of, of disease burden, like a lot of heart attacks, heart failure, bad lung disease. Those aren't really the, the best patients to start on dialysis. And I think it's very important for us as doctors um, to recognize that and to really have an informed decision-making conversation with the patient that, you know, I don't know if you would do well on dialysis. I don't know if you're necessarily the best candidate for it. Um, you can always approach sort of a, a trial period on dialysis. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's important to say that dialysis isn't for everyone. Um, it's the option you have when your kidneys fail, but you, there are other options. And that's really focused at dealing with the complications of kidney disease without needing dialysis. So you would take diuretics to deal with fluid overload, um, blood pressure pills to manage blood pressure, uh, certain medicines to bind potassium so the potassium doesn't get too high, um, dealing with the kind of effects of toxin buildup, which can cause poor sleep, poor appetite, you would give medicines for that. So that's kind of the alternative approach to dialysis or transplant. When to start dialysis. So um, when estimated kidney function drops below 15%, these are the patients you start considering dialysis for. Um, typically, you know, we don't count on just the number alone. It really depends on how the patient feels, what their labs look like, um, and if you can control their uh, issues with medicines alone. So when I mentioned worsening uremia, Uremia is really uh, a problem that arises from the toxins building up in the bloodstream. The kidney is normally supposed to dump a lot of uh, metabolic waste products into the urine. As kidney function declines, urine output declines, and these, these toxins that are, are uh, supposed to be lost build up. They cause a lot of generalized symptoms. So it's not very easy easy to identify that this is actually kidney dysfunction. Um, usually what's experienced is itching, nonspecific itching, poor sleep, so a patient will notice insomnia, uh, increased fatigue, sleeping all day, uh, poor appetite, some nausea. Uh, sometimes patients will have uh, changes in taste or smell. Uh, when it gets really bad and starts to affect the brain, patients will appear more confused, more slower to respond. Um, those are all signs that the uremic toxins are building up to very, very high levels. And so that is a reason to start someone on dialysis. You know, typically um, 
yes, this is the number we consider, but patients who are below 10% is when they're, you know, more seriously started on dialysis. So hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis. Um, just to, to briefly touch on this difference, uh, it's important for patients to know this. You know, these are the two conventional options for dialysis. One through the bloodstream, that is hemodialysis, and the other through the belly. Um, hemodialysis, you know, done in, in the outpatient clinic uh, three times a week. It's a lot of work for the patient. You know, I, I, I think of it as a part-time job. Uh, by the time you, you know, get over to the, to the dialysis unit, get uh, put onto the machine, get off the machine, get home, that's probably about five, six hours of your day gone. And you do that three times a week. Um, and that is your clearance for the week. So that is your kidney function for the week. And so you really depend on those treatments. Um, peritoneal dialysis is done at home. It involves basically... Uh, placing fluid, usually about two to three liters of fluid, into the abdomen. And that requires a catheter that stays in your abdominal wall. It, it, it traces into the inside of your abdomen. You're able to fill fluid in there, let it sit for about two to three hours, and then drain it. We have machines that do this for us. And so the patient is trained on how to do it. But ultimately, once they know how to do it, they plug up to a machine that has all the bags of solutions. They go to sleep. They dialyze through the night, they wake up, and they're done with their dialysis. That's what makes it a really nice option for patients who have kidney failure because um, they're not burdened by the dialysis. They plug themselves in before they go to sleep, um, and by the time they wake up, their dialysis is done. They can go about their day, disconnect themselves from the machine. So, um, you know, I think peritoneal dialysis is a favorable option for most people. Some people um, are bad candidates, and what makes you a bad candidate for peritoneal dialysis is generally someone who um, can't perform their own dialysis. That's not an absolute thing. If you have a lot of social support and someone who can help you at home, you can do it. But if you're blind, if you're not able to lift the bags, you have physical uh, incapacity, um, that can be a problem. Um, if you have had a lot of abdominal surgeries, you may have a lot of adhesions and scarring in your abdomen. You may not be the best candidate for this. Um, if you have a large hernia, the hernia really has to be fixed before you can start putting fluid in your belly. Um, a lot of times the surgeons, when they do the catheter placement, will fix the hernia at the same time. Um, you know, technically being very obese is, is a, a contraindication and, and makes you a bad candidate, but that's also not an absolute thing. Um, those are generally, you know, what, what makes a person a bad candidate. So I, you know, I'd say for most people who have kidney failure, peritoneal dialysis is a good option. Optimal start and home modality. So um, we have seen that patients who have established care with a kidney doctor are being monitored closely and are recognized to have failing kidneys and need to start dialysis are the ones who do best. The patients who kind of uh, don't have good follow-up, don't have good care, um, haven't seen a kidney doctor in a long time, haven't seen any doctor in a long time, they're the ones who tend to progress at, to the point of needing end-stage kidney disease. And oftentimes, they're feeling so horrible that they end up in the emergency room. And those are what we call the crash starts. People who show up to the hospital in horrible fluid overload, horrible uremia and need urgent dialysis and then, you know, continue dialysis thereafter. Our whole goal is to really avoid that. And that's why, you know, I, I'm always pushing for uh, early referral to the kidney doctor so that we can address uh, kidney function decline early on and plan for, you know, eventual dialysis start. Um, part of that planning it involves uh, getting the access uh, for dialysis. So, for hemodialysis, because it's done through the blood, you usually have what's called an AV fistula put into the arm. Um, that's a connection between an artery and vein. A uh, vascular surgeon does it. It's a relatively simple uh, uh, procedure. And um, it takes some time to mature and be ready to use so that it can be stuck with needles on a you know, consistent basis three times a week. Um, 
typically they need to be placed about two months before a person starts dialysis. Um, and so that's why it's important that when we recognize people falling into the kind of 20%, 15% level of kidney function, we send them to the vascular surgeon and get that done. Um, alternatively, if they want to do peritoneal dialysis, then we send them to a general surgeon and they place the peritoneal dialysis catheter. That one is usually done closer to the start time because it really doesn't need much time to heal, about two weeks and it's ready to use. Um, whereas the, the arterial, the, the AV access requires about two months. So it's, it really needs to be done sooner or further out. Um, a little bit about home dialysis. So uh, we talked about peritoneal dialysis being done at home. There is home hemodialysis. Uh, you can get a machine that does your dialysis and you can be trained on how to stick your own AV access. Um, typically, we want patients to have a caretaker or, you know, a family member who does um, the sticking of their, their AV axis for them. But this is an option. It's a good option. Um, again, it, it provides the patient with their own autonomy to kind of do their dialysis four, five, six times a week, get very good clearance, generally feel better. Um, and so I think it, it's becoming more popular but it does come with some constraints. That is, you know, the, there has to be an appropriate amount of plumbing and water flow. Um, the patient has to be able to successfully um, cannulate their own uh, access. And so a little, a, a few more limitations to it than uh, uh, as, as compared to peritoneal dialysis. Okay, the transplant option. Um, Anesthesia is flexible. I say that because Programs all over the country are really pushing for transplant. Um, and so, you know, generally one of the, the main things that will count you out from being considered for it is age. If you're, if you're about, you know, 70 or greater, um, you're typically not a very favorable candidate because of your advanced age. But uh, other than that, you know, you, you are considered a candidate um, for transplant. There are deceased donor transplants. That's where you wait on a list. Uh, and when a, uh, uh, someone who is willing to donate a kidney upon their death um, uh, and, and the organ is procured from that person, if you are at the top of the list and you are a match as far as your blood type uh, and antibody profile, then you can get a deceased donor kidney. Um, the living donor kidney uh, typically comes from someone you know, like a friend or family member who's willing to donate. Um, the deceased donor route, unfortunately in California, takes waiting on the list uh, for a deceased donor about eight to 10 years on average. Um, so that's why I think it's important that when we uh, see people declining beyond a level of 20%, that's when we can refer them and get them listed to a, a transplant center. That way they start collecting time and, uh, and you know, they, they get higher up on the list. Um, a living donor, typically if you have a living donor, you get evaluated, then they get evaluated, they check for compatibility. It can happen as fast as a year. So living donor transplantations um, can happen a lot faster. Local transplant centers nearby, we have UCSD, Sharp, uh, Sharp Scripps, Loma Linda, Further up in LA, there's Cedar sinai uh, UCLA, um, USC. So there's quite a few transplant centers in Southern California. Okay, so some closing statements. Um, all diabetic patients with proteinuria should be on an ACE inhibitor or uh, uh, an angiotensin receptor blocker. Um, plus or minus an SGLT2 inhibitor. I really think this is more plus than minus. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors are great medicines. Um, I encourage you know, all of the, the uh, primary care providers to start the SGLT2s. Don't be afraid to start them um, even before referral. Feel free to refer early. As kidney doctors, we always welcome it. We welcome seeing uh, patients who have chronic kidney disease to see what can we do to help them out uh, and try and delay their progression. Um, always recheck a high creatinine before an urgent referral to a nephrologist. It's always helpful to know, you know, is this confirmed or sustained uh, kidney injury? Uh, and that helps us decide what to do next. 
um, as kidney function declines, make sure that your, your medications are being dosed appropriately, okay? And uh, that's it for me. So I, I want to thank all of you for being such a great audience. I appreciate the questions. Um, I'm here to take any further questions. Doc. Doc. Yes. We had a question from someone watching online. Oh, sure. Uh, when you were talking about the home dialysis, they are asking how does diet affect uh, doing that dialysis? How does diet affect? So in general, uh, when you are end-stage kidney disease and on dialysis of any type, um, the, 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 the diet becomes very strict. And that's because of the kidney not clearing like it should and you relying on dialysis. So what becomes a problem is foods high in potassium, foods high in phosphorus, and fluid intake. So we tell patients to limit uh, foods that are high in potassium, like bananas, potatoes, uh, avocados, tomatoes, papaya, mango, really a lot of great foods that you know, most people enjoy eating have to be limited when you're on dialysis. Um, foods high in phosphorus. Phosphorus is yet another uh, compound that's ubiquitous in food. It's in all foods. You have to try and limit the foods that are highest in that, like beans, dairy, um, uh, dark sodas. Protein intake um, is actually encouraged when you're end-stage kidney disease. So we, we do say patients should target at least a gram of protein per kilogram of body weight each day. Um, that's, you know, that, that's the main difference. Once you slide into that category of end-stage kidney disease, your diet is very restrictive. You do have to limit how much fluid you drink as well because you're not urinating as much. A lot of patients on dialysis actually within the first year stop urinating completely. So you cannot just drink freely all the time. You have to really limit your intake to about a liter of everything. That's tea, coffee, water, everything per day. I think uh, you had a question, yeah. For going forward, um, if you have a question, just put your hand up because for the sake of those who are watching online, they would like to hear the question too. So I know we can all hear each other. So we've got one here. Just if you raise your hand, Tony's going to be bringing the mic around. So with all this medication that people are taking and different, how does that impact your liver? Because so, you're doing it to help your kidneys, but all of this medication is not good for your liver either. Well, so the, the, the two medications that we really um, want patients to be on are the um, ACE inhibitors, and the angiotensin receptor blockers and the SGLT2 inhibitors. Those medicines really aren't toxic to the liver. Okay. Um, and so we don't worry about liver effects with those medicines. So lisinopril is not damaging to the kidney or to the liver? It's not damaging to the liver um, and it's not damaging to the kidney. Now, I, 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 I did want to raise that point of cautioning patients when you're dehydrated not to take the lisinopril. Okay, yeah. Because in that case, it can injure the kidney. But really, uh, you know, in general, no. It's actually therapeutic to the kidney. Okay. And then if you have um, polycystic um, cysts, which are, is that like calcium buildup or is that different? It's different. So, so th those are actual, you know, cystic spaces in the kidney. Okay. And what's the difference between the two? Between calcium cysts and polycystic cysts? Well, so, so I think you're, you're referring to calcium stones. Uh-huh. So calcium is more of an issue... Uh, in terms of causing stones. Whereas cysts, unless you have a polycystic kidney, that is so many cysts in each kidney, you usually don't have kidney disease oh, okay. from it. Okay. okay. And then with the calcium cysts though, that's um, like you can get that from something that's in chocolate and spinach. I can't remember the name of it. Something that helps cause those. Oh yeah, so there is... Um, There are some uh, metabolic issues with, yeah, certain foods. Um, gosh, I can't think of the name. I know with licorice, you might have an issue. Um, generally, you don't have to worry about, you know, what you're taking in terms of, of calcium stones. There are guidelines as far as what to add to your diet. Mm -hmm. But um, generally, you're, you're able to eat a normal calcium diet. Um, 
the main thing is really low sodium diet and plenty of water if you have stones. Okay. And so if you do have those type of stones, do you need to see a, a nephrologist or? I think generally if you have only had one episode, probably not. If you have recurrence of kidney stones, you probably should see a kidney doctor. All right, these are all really good questions. Any, um, anything else from the, the chat online or, okay. I have a question or two, maybe it'll give people a chance. To, um, you talked about home dialysis. In your experience, is that something that's uncovered on let's say Medi-Cal, Medicare, commercial plans? What's your, I know that as a provider, we don't always know this, but from your experience, what can you address that? Yeah, um, certainly more so peritoneal dialysis covered uh, without issue for, you know, medic, full Medi-Cal, Medicare patients. Um, of course, when you are declared end stage kidney disease, you are automatically eligible for Medicare. Um, and so, yeah, peritoneal dialysis is covered. Home hemodialysis is covered, um, but it has, there's some difficulty in getting it fully set up. Um, I can't say exactly what, and I know you do have to justify extra sessions if you want that. Um, but, but I, I would say generally the home hemodialysis and certainly the peritoneal dialysis are covered. Hello, um, I have a question. I have a family member who has diabetes and I find the most challenging for me is what to cook or the nutrition and um, I bake a lot, so I use monk sugar. What do you, how do you feel about sugars um, such as monk sugar or alternative sugars because she has diabetes? I think, yeah, I, I, that, that's, a, that's a complicated topic, I think. And I, I, I think we don't really know enough about the artificial sweeteners. Um, do they have a role in kidney disease? I'm not really sure. I think for now, it's fair to use them as a substitute because they do give you know, the, the sweet taste without raising the, the blood sugars. And so they are kind of favorable in diabetics. What the long-term effects of those are, I think it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think there's so much competing data out there right now that we need more longer-term data and, and more of an analysis of all of these, uh, all of these trials to see, you know, all of these observational studies to see what is the true effect and is it bad for us? Okay. So the best thing to do is just seek a nutritionist that will. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And, and nutritionists are very good at, at giving you carbohydrate uh, counseling. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Yes. Um, what about uh, your A1C? You know, you get that done every three months and. Show, say it shows you're 5.7 or whatever, you're still under with guidelines, but you're the roller coaster. How do you, how do you help control that when you're a roller coaster, when your sugars are going up and down, up and down, up and down? Um, it really depends on how bad it's getting. I mean, some people, even when they get controlled and reach A1Cs less than seven, um, need to stay on insulin to help blunt those spikes. Um, you know, and it's also a matter of stacking medications. So, uh, you know, using metformin as the base and then adding on some of these newer agents, the SGLT2 inhibitor is a nice agent to help, uh, control sugars. And then, um, uh, there's all these glutides, semaglutide, ozempic. Those are also being, you know, advertised a lot. And they're, they're also very good agents. Um, cause for one thing, they do limit your appetite. And so that also helps with the spikes and it helps with weight loss as well. Does that work the same for a pre-diabetic? No. Um, Pre-diabetics generally, you know, are, are just counseled and watched. Okay. Um, not until you're full blown do you really start to add on medications. But that's, that's not absolutely true. You know, some pre-diabetics get started on metformin just for weight loss benefits as well. So, um, Yeah. I think, I think there, there's, there's ways to control sugars. Um, and ultimately, it's the patient and, and what they're eating, too. 
the other question I have is when you get these blood tests done, like the cronatin and whatnot, and sometimes on your blood tests, they'll show an H high, but maybe they're about between um, zero, I mean, one and five higher than what's recommended on the right hand side further. So sometimes your doctors will tell you, oh, you don't need to worry. Your blood tests were all fine, but then you get a copy of your blood test and you see that high. And like I said, they're like maybe one to five. Do you not worry about that? Or is it if it continues that you need to start to worry or? You know, especially when it comes to kidney function, it's about the overall trend, really. And so I think if your doctor is reassuring you that you don't you know, have to worry, it's because they think your kidney function is stable. Um, so it's probably showing you that you have abnormal kidney function, but as long as you're staying within that range, that's, that's the key really. And so it's about the overall trend as opposed to just the single value. Yes, of course. While he's traveling, let me ask my other question and give people also another idea. So you, we talked about yeast infections, UTIs, um, with using the SGLT2s. If I have, or anyone here is a, has a history of, like anytime they take an antibiotic, they get a yeast infection. Would you recommend, and as somebody that would be a good candidate, we want to, you know, meets all the other criteria. Is there any role for us doing a prophylactic yeast you know, prevention medication like we do with some folks who always get a yeast infection every time we give them antibiotic? Is there a role to put someone on that if you're going to start them on one of these medications? I think um, generally you could, but I, in my own practice, I typically wait for something to develop. And if a yeast infection does happen, then I start to think about uh, and especially knowing that they're higher risk and have this problem, then I, I start to think about something preventative to be on as a maintenance medication while they're on it. I have a uh, well, we'll start in the back. Oh, yes. Um, I, I was diagnosed with hypertension, and my doctor had put me on lisinopril. I started out with 20 milligrams, and... Um, it still was. It was still high around 150. So she put me on 40. When does when, How high can you go on lisinopril? And when? What does uh, resistant hypertension? What does that mean? If I don't um, react or uh, to the lisinopril, am I resistant to? Am I considered resistant hypertension? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, lisinopril, the max dose is 40 milligrams. And so that's, that's as far as you can go with that medicine. Um, if you're only on one medicine, but you're still uncontrolled, you're not technically resistant. We, we classify resistant hypertension as being on three medicines and controlled or needing four medicines, okay? Um, so if you're on three medicines, max dose, um, and you're still, you're, you know, you're, you're still uncontrolled, but you're on four medicines, let's say, and you're controlled, that's when you're actually resistant. Thank you. Of course. Oh. <clears throat> I notice um, constipation, the medicines cause constipation, slow down your, your digestive tract and everything. These ones, not, not specifically, no. Um, constipation is really um, a matter of aging, for one thing. It, it does coincide with, you know, an increased age. Um, and we do see it worsening in chronic kidney disease as well. Um, so it's not really a, a product of the medicines. It's kind of both, you know, advanced age and, uh, and worsening kidney function. Well, is it okay to take excellent? Of course, yeah. So, so something like Miralax is safe. Um, you can really use it on everyone. Um, and it doesn't really have any toxic effects. Thank you. Yes. How, did you, how do you protect if you only have one kidney? What are the do's and don'ts? 
Yeah, so um, it's really about preservation then. And so um, being on these medicines, especially if you have protein leakage, uh, and then avoiding anything that's toxic. So really, when you have one kidney, it's, it's very precious. Um, you want to avoid medicines that are known to be toxic to the kidney, like the ibuprofens, Aleve, naproxen, all of those, okay? Um, that's, that's, that's general information for anyone with chronic kidney disease, especially those with only one kidney. Um, so, you know, pain is a, a very common problem. Arthritis is a common problem. Um, people do tend to use ibuprofens and meloxicam and all these other medicines, but those are toxic to the kidney. Um, and so, you know, we generally say Tylenol is preferred, doesn't have any um, toxicity to the kidney. But I think we all have to um, weigh that up against quality of life. So, you know, people need pain relief, but we don't really want them using these medicines. So can they use it sparingly? Yes. In some cases, you know, you can. Um, can you use some alternative therapy? Um, that's also preferred, you know, so, so it's really just about preservation, um, avoiding the bad drugs, taking the, you know, the good ones and controlling all the risk factors, good blood pressure, good diabetes control. Yes. What's the lowest that your blood pressure you need to be concerned? Well, so generally, um, you know, I, I think you shouldn't really be below 105 systolic. Um, that, that's, and that's a personal opinion. You know, I, I think we, as doctors, we define low blood pressure as below 90 systolic. That's, I think, just, that's excessive. That means you are pretty sick for whatever reason. Um, so generally, I think blood pressure shouldn't be below 105 systolic. Yeah. The sweet spot is really... 105 to 130. And so how would you measure that? Because like I was taking lisinopril, I was taking 10 milligrams and my heart doctor raised me to 20. Well, when I went to 20, my blood pressure was going between 90 and 60. And so when I came here, you know, they reduced me back down to 10, but I haven't gotten to see my heart doctor. So I'm, you know, I, I don't even want to be taking the Cinepril in the first place. Um, yeah. You know, I'm wanting to try to get off of it, but I was just wondering like when I should be concerned about it going down. So 105 would be. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think if you told your cardiologist that it had that much of an effect on you, yeah. they would understand Okay. And, and stick with lower dose. Yeah. And then, so when you're taking that, what is the average that you should be? So like, should I be 120 or, cause like when I was taking 10, I was running still like 149. Is that normal of that doing that or? Well, everyone's different. Um, so, you know, you, you want to be below 130 and, okay. and, you know, as I alluded to earlier, there's more evidence to say now that you should actually be below 120. Right. Um, so to, to that, that's kind of the goal and that's how doctors will adjust medications to reach that goal. Um, it may, it may be difficult with lisinopril. So you may need a, a base dose of lisinopril, um, and then an added medication to get you there, you know, instead of just increasing the lisinopril alone. Um, but, but I think, you know, if lisinopril is indicated for you, then the key is to get that up to the, the highest dose they can. So ideally, if that's all you need for blood pressure, that'd be perfect. You know, but it just, everyone responds differently to these medicines. Some people are very sensitive to them. Do you currently take patients in Escondido? Yes. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of the new patients. So, so we can at least get evaluated. Yeah. I see a urologist for my sis. Okay. But she's not a kidney specialist. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm accepting new patients. Um, I've seen a lot of patients actually from this health council. So, um, you know, if your doctor um, thinks it's appropriate. Um, do you have to have a referral for you? 
Typically, you do with HMOs, yeah. I mean, not an HMO, PPO. With a PPO, you yeah. typically don't know. Okay. You could self-refer. So, um, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to see anyone here in clinic, anyone you know in clinic. Yeah, and my my office is kind of in the downtown Escondido area. Just to piggyback on that, um, he's correct. You can self refer, but if you're worried about copays or anything for your visits, if you come to the provider here, we do a referral. You can bring in your receipts to Leanne and PRC. So, but you can go without a referral, as far as their office accepting. So just. And will the doctors If you, if you discuss it with your provider, I'm sure he or she will do the referral. They are our preferred nephrology group. So, okay. so you're talking to the right people. All right, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Um, okay. Lab work for the one clinic. Are you, are you supposed to be doing lab work for like once a month, six months out of the year, or how's that go? It depends on the level of kidney disease. So, um, People, you can live with one kidney and have totally normal kidney function, you know, the way it's measured. Um, your kidney numbers can look totally normal. If they do, then you don't need to see a kidney doctor that often or have the lab checked that often. Um, if you are having kidney disease, the creatinine is higher than normal, then it depends. So if you're in the mild to moderate stage, you know, every three to six months is, a, is, is kind of the interval to check. If it's severe, then it's like every one to three months. Okay. Yeah. So it really just depends on how severe. Yes. What do you think about uh, super pubic catheters uh, to eliminate f frequent UTIs for an individual who is paralyzed from the waist down? Yeah. Um, certainly, it sounds like if, if someone has paralysis, they probably don't have great bladder function. And having a weak bladder does make you higher risk for UTIs. You know, that is a, a, an association. So in that case, a suprapubic catheter is, is the preferred long-term way of dealing with urine output. Um, because a Foley catheter has to, you know, go, go through the urethra and up to the bladder, whereas a suprapubic catheter is just straight into the bladder. Um, both have their complications, you know, and both get colonized with bacteria and cause problems. But, but the suprapubic catheter is technically the more preferred way of doing things for someone who has a weak bladder. Thank you. Yes. Are there any others uh, online? Any other questions for us? No? Going once? Going Yes, I do. I'm pretty sure I do. Let me grab them. Yeah, a good, a good speaker always brings cards with him or her. So, yeah, perfect. Well, if there aren't any further questions, let's give uh, our doctor a round of applause here. And, Thank you. And an appreciation. You we have commissioned a gourd for you. So for oh, your time, we appreciate yeah, it. Nice Enjoy. You. And uh, you can so we do have these slides. If you are interested, let us know. We can email them to you. Um, I just want to get his permission first before I just assume. So we have those that we can you just give us a good email address and we can email them if you like them. So um, again, I appreciate this. Um, what I'd like to do right now is I know that we've promised you food, but before you get food, I want my diabetes team to come up here on behalf of our full team. I want you to get if you don't already know our folks, I'm going to introduce them and let them give a little spiel about what they do and how they can help you. As you are hearing about, you know, diet and exercise, again, medication is part of, uh, of what we do, but lifestyle is a big part of it. And talking about, you know, diet, exercise, um, lifestyle everyone's plan may look a little different because everybody's body, everybody's circumstances are different. So um, while our doc here gave us a great, you know, overview, obviously everyone's situation is very individual. So this is where we have our team members um, that beyond just seeing your, your regular provider, we've got a team here that specialize in di dietary nutrition. We've got Lorelai, who is our 
our community health representative, she'll come to the house, she'll help you look at those medications, get them set up, answer questions, be there, see what we can help with. We've got Tony here who is our physical activity specialist. So I'm going to hand the mic over and let them give you a quick little spiel before we get food for you. Hi, everyone. I'm Misty. I'm the registered dietitian here at the clinic. I'm here Monday through Friday, 8 to 430. Come see me. Even if you don't have any nutrition needs, you can always stop by and see me. Hi, I'm Laura Lely Gaspi, and I am the public health representative. And I do home visits. Um, please call me, or if you don't call me, I will call you. And you know, try to knock on your door, and you know, ask you know, if I could do home visit. Also, um, check um, the social media: Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. I have a cooking demonstration um, channel, um, Indian Health Council in the Kitchen with Lorelai. There are about twelve or more recipes in there and you could learn you know um, simple recipes that you could um, uh, try at home and it's diabetic friendly and um, there's going to be another taping in April about three recipes and that's going to come out you know very soon thank you very much all right my name is Tony Sharon I am the physical activity specialist I get to do all the fun stuff in the gym uh, with the weight, uh, corrective exercises that could also, um, you know, help with previous injuries, um, and really, um, going along with the diabetes, you know, working out is a huge part of it with adding weights, um, help burning those additional sugars, uh, which in terms help for internal organs, um, you know, getting that sugar out, um, as much as possible, uh, building as much neuromuscular control as possible, uh, building a strong foundation and, uh, really getting you that confidence that's needed. Um, definitely come into the gym. If you just have even just a basic question, uh, you can reach out to any one of the team. Um, we're, we're here, you know, eight to eight to four thirty. So, um, any questions, shoot us emails, text, whatever, any way you can get a hold of us, uh, you can, um, open policy. So, you know, we're here. Thank you. I didn't introduce myself, but I figure most of you know who I am. I'm Dr. Elaine Davidson, family practitioner, been here for now my 16th year and is serving as assistant medical director now for the last two years. So um, we as providers want to do our best to, again, provide you with the resources. We'll do internal referrals. We refer out to our specialists um, to answer to some of the th things that we talked about earlier. Your provider is typically going to do labs at least once a year, if you, especially if we know you're a known diabetic or pre-diabetic, looking at liver, looking at kidney. We're doing all those basic things. Obviously, he's talking to us about kidney, um, but we're also screening for liver, thyroid, the whole cholesterol, all these things that can be additive. And we do Anytime you're on medication, we want to be watching all of that. So um, with that, I do want to, if the team wants to, I know you probably want to get ready to for the food, so I'll let you guys head up. I want to, I, I want to acknowledge we have three representatives here from outside groups who have tables outside. If you haven't already had a chance, we have a representative from the American Diabetes Association has come down from Simi Valley to uh, have some information. She's got a little pre-screening uh, if you're if you're not diabetic and you want to be screened, uh, we have someone from Smart, our Kidney Smart program that you saw him mention there on the slide, as well as Davida. So make use of them. They're here. They've got materials if you haven't already picked them up. But uh, I think we're ready. I'm going to give them just a, give them a second to get food. We have a light lunch for you all, trying to keep it nice and healthy. Um, any other questions for anybody before we get you ready to eat? I just wanted to thank you and the doctor for all the information. And um, I'm hoping that maybe you guys could schedule one for uh, to talk about the liver because we have different, you know, like cirrhosis of the liver, but it's not just alcohol. There's fatty liver, which is, you know, a big issue. And um, I think that would be really beneficial too. And then I think even for this class, I only knew about it because I seen it. I happened to be at medical this morning. So I, you know, I came, but I think it'd be nice if they sent him to flyers to the tribe or you can send it to Patrick Viveris. He sends everything to everybody. So that would be really helpful. And I'm glad that I was able to get in. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, we appreciate the feedback. So any other feedback you can give to any of us that got the shirts on because we want to learn from the experience, but definitely look at liver. Um, we did put post things on our socials and we are trying to get the word out, but, uh, and we do any of our flyers for events we send through admin to go to our tribal representatives. So it may just be a matter of getting it trickling down a little bit faster. So thank you for the feedback and we will do that for future. Anything else? All right. I think I appreciate your attendance. Thank you so much. And great questions. Great presentation. Hopefully uh, we're going to be working on some things as part of the diabetes team. We're working on some future events, probably coming out to some of the tribes, um, trying to do some little events as well. So kind of keep keep your ears listening and eyes for that. We'll try to get some that out when we have some dates and times. So, ooh, I think the food's coming to you. This is even better. You have a comment, Doc? Closing comments. I, I left a stack of my cards uh, with the gentleman. He's with DeVita. So you'll see his table outside and he'll have my cards. Okay. If you want to grab one. Okay. Thank you all for your attention. With that, I think we'll go ahead and close the program. Food's being distributed. So those of you at online, sorry, you have to be present to win the food. So. <laughs>